When you have a congregation that has that history of 150 years, and you could say, you know, we are largely living our lives today the same way they lived their lives 150 years ago, even as it evolves and changes. There's a richness and an excitement and an inspiration to that. My name is Mordechai Fleischer, Rabbi Mordechai Fleischer. I am the rabbi of Congregation Zara Abraham, historic synagogue here on the west side of Denver. I'm told there was some, something like 10 or 12 different synagogues you know, running up and down the Colfax, West Colfax area. Unfortunately, this is the last synagogue standing. Uh, but there were, from what I understand, quite a lot of Jews here. My family arrived in Denver in the early 1900s. The west side is where they settled. It's history, my history, in my heart. And we're still a community. Maybe we're living farther distances out, but we still manage to come together and still be a community. But over the last half century, people expected the, the, that the community would just diminish and, and fade away. We're still here. To me, it's very fascinating. It's one of the few places in the country where the Jewish community, 150 years later, is, is still has a Jewish presence. So there is still, obviously, the numbers are much smaller, but there is a, a very vibrant Jewish community in this West Side neighborhood to this day. The Denver Jewish community, we all connected in some way, but when you talk about the Denver West Side community, it's a very tight community in that sense, and we're one family. I don't think you can find anything like this in any other community, any other city. Small has the infrastructure of a larger community and uh, ability for your children to feel part of something and, and be someone, not just be another number. The Rocky Mountain Jewish Historical Society and Beck Archives work in tandem to preserve and publicize the really vibrant Jewish history of the Rocky Mountain region with an emphasis on Colorado. 1859 marked the beginning of Denver and it also marked the beginning of Denver's Jewish community. Jews were here present at creation, so to speak. They came out here primarily, I would say, because of economic opportunity and also for additional freedom and to escape persecution. 1880, there were about 250,000 Jews in the United States, most of them of German-Jewish extraction. And while most people came out here because of the gold rush and the, the hope of striking it rich quickly, which rarely happened, but Jews basically, we like to say, mined the miners. They generally were suppliers for the miners. So they had, from the beginning, a very strong economic um, uh, input and niche, and they were also soon very involved in politics and city building. Most of them, not all, but most of them were Reformed Jews, and they became very Americanized and acculturated. Starting in about 1880, we start to have a huge influx of Eastern European Jewish immigrants. They are fleeing even more extreme poverty, I would say, than their German Jewish counterparts. Poverty is probably the main impetus, but a major Jew, um, persecution as well, pogroms that we're all familiar with. The pogroms of Eastern Europe were horrible, especially under the Tsar. Those days, uh, especially for Jewish boys, you were forcibly conscripted into the army. And the Tsar would have agents who would go to Jewish villages, marketplaces, and literally they were called chappers. A chapp in Yiddish means to snatch or to grab. And they would literally grab boys, Jewish boys and forcibly conscript them into the army. They would have been cut off from their family. They could have been 12 years old or maybe a little younger and lose any type of Jewish identity that they have. And, and my father said, your life was worse than that of a starving dog. 
My grandfather uh, became a merchant seaman and he jumped ship working his way to America and uh, to escape the Tsar's army. In Denver in 1882, we get a group of 50 Russian Jews who come here with the aid of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. They had dreamed of farming, which was prohibited um, to them in Russia. They were not allowed to own land, a tremendous persecution. And so this group comes out to Cotopaxi. Cotopaxi is not what shall I say, a primary um, area for robust farming. They encounter so many um, challenges, bad weather, don't have a lot of experience, rocky areas, no water. The colony collapsed in about 1884 and all of the colonists dispersed. So the congregation itself was founded in 1889 and a lot of the original founders were Jews who came from Cotopaxi, Colorado. You had Jews from different parts of Europe, you know, coming here, largely Eastern Europe, uh, and creating, uh, you know, I guess a rich culture of different uh, groups from the Jewish diaspora, you know, all living in this one area over here. I was born in Denver, Colorado in 1927. I am now 95 years old. This is my high school picture. My family arrived in Denver in the early 1900s. My father came from Poland and my mother came from Russia. They settled in Denver because they already had some people in Denver. The west side is where they settled. My father immigrated from Poland in about 1920. His father came earlier about 1911, they all landed on the west side in the same community. By the early 1900s, then augmented by the people who were also coming out to chase the cure for tuberculosis, the community, the west side Jewish community, really began to grow. These are records for National Jewish Hospital. Tuberculosis was the leading cause of death in the United States and um, the world in Europe in the late 19th and early 20th century. There was no magic bullet, no medication for tuberculosis. Um, for decades, um, certainly at least until around the turn of the century, most doctors didn't even realize that TB was a communicable disease. They felt it was a hereditary disease best treated in an environment that was dry, high altitude, and sunny. And of course, Colorado fit that prescription perfectly. The problem was many, many people came out here. There was no treatment and there were no formal structures, um, no hospitals to treat um, TB patients. And it was the Jewish community in Denver that came to the fore with the founding of National Jewish Hospital for Consumptives in 1899, today National Jewish Health, and the Jewish Consumptives Relief Society um, Sanatorium, which opened in 1904 on West Colfax. Around 1904, the Jewish population here was about 1,500. By 1914, it was 15,000. My grandparents, they were both from Ukraine. They ended up in Denver uh, as patients at the JCRS Hospital. JCRS stood for Jewish Consumptive Relief Society. Many of those people who graduated from the TB sanatoriums made their way to Denver, the west side proper. As a matter of fact, the Jewish population on the west side was so robust that um, people jokingly referred to the um, viaduct as the Jewish Passover. But it, it was a very dense, intense Jewish neighborhood. And I would say at that time, probably 95% of the population that was packed into that area under the viaduct was Jewish. I often tell people as a, as a Brooklyn boy growing up in, in New York that I compare it to Jewish immigrants who settled in New York. There was a huge, huge Lower East Side community in Manhattan. You kind of had a similar thing over here where this was kind of, I guess, the lower class end of town. 
and it wasn't the expensive part of town. And, you know, so you had an immigrant Jewish community that was settling here all together. My grandparents never learned how to speak English. My grandmother knew to answer the phone, and if it was one of her daughters, she would say hello, and they'd talk in Yiddish. If it was somebody she didn't know, she would just hang up. You can imagine that they were economically challenged, but they were all hard workers. Many of the Jewish boys and some girls on the west side in the early 1900s became Denver Newsies. They sold um, newspapers, street corners, even in downtown as well, to earn really like nickels and dimes to bring home for their families to help support them. Now the west side of Denver was very interesting. It scanned from, I would say, about a mile east of the Platte River, going west up all the way to Sheridan. West Colfax was the main street. Everything came from West Colfax. There were grocery stores, butcher shops, bakeries, barber shop, bathhouse, everything. I think most everybody felt comfortable because they had what they needed there. In the 1920s, probably through the 1950s, there was a Jewish-owned grocery store almost on every corner in West Colfax. Obviously, you would think they would be rivals for business, but there was a great deal of camaraderie. In the early days, there were six pharmacies on West Colfax between Federal and Sheridan, all owned by Jewish pharmacists. So they were only several blocks apart. Tobin Pharmacy originally was started by my father-in-law, Lou Tobin, on Colfax and Newton in 1936. He went to University of Denver. He graduated during the Depression as a chemical engineer, and there were no jobs. So he bought a book about pharmacy, studied it, and took the exam and was registered as a pharmacist. I still have his license that says registered by examination. And then in 1948, he built the newer store, which at time was a supersized store on Colfax and Quitman. When they opened the store in 1948, I was small. I don't remember too much about it, but I do remember they had beach balls in the window. And that was a big thing. Oh, he had everything. He had, of course, prescriptions, over-the-counter medications, cosmetics, perfumes, toys for the kids, household goods. Come on back here. Relics. And nobody else cares for it except me. This is the older fountain menu from probably 1948 when the pharmacy first opened. A fresh strawberry sundae for 25 cents. Regular Sundays were 20 cents. According to the prices, ancient history. N nothing like this will happen again. And it was a place to go. Saturday nights it was packed with people that would walk in the neighborhood. He was a, a fixture in the community. Everybody knew him and uh, trusted him. I believe he taught me that the most important thing a person can hear is their own name. You know, you go to a chain store, a corporate store, you don't get that. But in a, a community uh, like, like the West Side, the way Tobin's was, that was important. And that's what brought people back. Two years after I graduated, he offered to sell the store to me for a very reasonable price. And here's what Tobin's Pharmacy looks like even today, and it now says Tobin's Liquor. 
I loved the store growing up, and so I was glad that we could keep it. You know, our families were, both our families were very close, so it, it was very easy transition. I bought the store from my father-in-law in 1969, and uh, we closed the business in 2005. There are so many people who came from the West Side, sung and unsung, who have contributed to the success of the Mile High City. West Side um, Jewish immigrants, Eastern European Jews, who came um, through Denver and, and made a pretty significant um, mark in, in the world. Golda Meir lived in Denver, who became one of the most uh, powerful, important women in the, in the world. One of the first, if not the first woman, to serve as the prime minister of a country. The Samsonite luggage was born here from a West Side Jewish immigrant family, the Schwader family, which, which is one of the most famous, if not the most famous, luggage producer in, in the world. Ruth Mosco Handler came from an immigrant Eastern European Jewish family that settled first on the West Side. She felt that uh, girls would like a, a doll that wasn't a baby doll. Of course, that became an extreme um, success, and she's kind of a poster child for American women and American Jewish women as entrepreneurs. I don't want to give you the impression that there was no, absolutely no anti-Semitism here, but I think that Jews were welcomed for the contributions they could make, and people at the time were not as focused on the um, ethnic or religious backgrounds of the people as long as they could make a contribution. There certainly were rises of anti-Semitism in certain periods, KKK here in the 1920s and 1930s was not just anti-black, but anti-Jewish as well. And my dad told me this story. Clan members would drive up and down West Colfax and yell out anti-Semitic slurs at Jews, throw bricks and rocks through storefronts, and intimidate Jewish people. And my dad was maybe about 11 or 12 years old by this time. My dad and his friends had had enough as he told it, he was at the alleyway on West Colfax between Lowell and Mead Street. Here comes this car, jalopy of some sort, and my dad's wearing his yarmulke kippah, identifiably as a Jew, and he had a brick behind his back. They yell out some slur, my dad takes the brick and throws it through the windshield of the car. The car stops, out come six big guys, teenagers, big guys, and they're gonna beat up a little kid. My dad gives a whistle, whoosh, around the corner comes six guys, up the alley comes another four guys, down the street comes another five guys, and so forth. So what did they do? Did they walk away? And my father said, oh no, they crawled away. A few days later, uh, the FBI shows up, going down, canvassing West Colfax, asking people, we understood there was an incident with the Klan, and so on and so forth, can you tell us what you saw? And everybody said, I didn't see nothing. Did you see anything? I didn't see nothing. They never came back. It was a very close-knit community. Some people who were here in the 30s, 40s, 50s, you're going to see that extreme camaraderie that they had. It was a wonderful place to grow up. Everyone knew everyone. We all knew who lived in what house. The doors were always open, the mothers were always welcoming to anybody that came in. And I still have friends that I went to first grade with. I'm the little dark-haired kid there. And Sherry is uh, right up there. Sherry and I were classmates from first grade on. We always knew each other and her friends were, were my friends when we were about 15 or 16, uh, we started dating, and the rest is history. My parents lived on Knox Court, and in Jewish communities, everybody lived on Knox Court. It was known as the, the Street of Little Porches. If you go there today, you can still see some of those old houses are still there, and they're little porches. 
Uh, and my parents lived across the street from each other and they met in the uh, early 50s and they uh, ended up getting married. And my grandfather is a very adorable little man. He had a little charity box. In Yiddish, they called it a pishka. And he would have a route and he would call on certain people and they would give him what they could afford, a quarter, a dollar, whatever. And he would accumulate that money. And then at the end of the week, he would give it to the Hebrew school right next door to where he lived on West 14th Avenue. That was the old Talmud Torah, as they called it. On the Sabbath, Orthodox Jews don't use electricity. And there is a, a very popular food on the Sabbath. It's called cholent. It probably comes from the French cholent uh, stew. So the Star Bakery, which was an early kosher bakery, it used to idle on low, I guess, their ovens over the week, you know, over the Sabbath when they weren't operating and people were able to put their cholent pots in and, and come get them. Most of us, I believe, have good memories of the West Side. On the high holidays, our people would walk down to the Platte River to throw away their sins. That was kind of a tradition. And the boys, boys will be boys, you know, they collected a lot of stickers. Where they got them, I don't know. And they would throw them in the girl's hair. That was their entertainment. Sloan's Lake was our playground. We, we loved it as kids. We'd go down there and along 17th Avenue wasn't landscaped in those days. It was just weedy. We'd go down there and catch horny toads and uh, go fishing in the lake for carp or whatever was available. There was nothing worthwhile. They also loved the regattas at Lake Junior High. They had sailboats. They used to do, boys would make uh, sailboats in shop class and they would have a regatta and their sailboats on Sloan's Lake. If you lived east of Newton Street, you went to Cheltenham. If you lived west of Newton Street, you went to Colfax School. Colfax was a real small school. We didn't even have a gym in the beginning or a lunchroom. We, we went home for lunch. You could walk. I mean, I lived on Yates. The school was on Tennyson. We had time to walk home for lunch. It was probably 85 to 90% Jewish kids. And on the Jewish holidays, there were probably five or six kids in a class that, that weren't Jewish. Lake Junior High was the junior high school for everybody. It was a beautiful school. And then we had a choice between going to North Denver High or West High School. We all went to the Hebrew Educational Alliance after school for Hebrew school. Bar and bat mitzvahs and confirmation cl class. And it was, you know, it was community. Everything was community. Well, the synagogue started in uh, 1932. And uh, what was happening a lot of mothers and families were um, concerned that their children, who were first-generation Jewish Americans, weren't getting a proper Jewish education. And they started a group. Then uh, it evolved in finally becoming a synagogue, and it became the Hebrew Educational Alliance. And they recruited a young man of 26 years old. He was uh, over six feet tall. His name was Rabbi Emanuel Laterman. I came to Denver on October the 25th, 1932, to a new congregation called the Hebrew Education Alliance. Rabbi Laterman's approach was also bringing what is called, or what was called at the time, modern Orthodox Judaism. I was going to be a, an Orthodox rabbi without a beard, which was something unheard of. And I was going to be preaching in English rather than in Yiddish, which was what my colleagues, the other Orthodox rabbis on the west side of Denver, were using as their language of communication. Uh, he also introduced uh, in the uh, late 30s, early 40s, the celebration of bat mitzvah. 
the bar mitzvah is a common ceremony. It's a coming of age ceremony uh, and uh, for young men, for boys. Uh, but Rabbi Lederman also thought it was very important to bring bat mitzvah into synagogue life and worship. And it was done when girls were 12 years old, not 13 like boys. He was so brilliant. He understood people's problems. He could discuss any subject. He was, just, he was the best as far as I'm concerned. He advocated amongst his congregants to be involved in your community, be involved in civic causes. He was also uh, the, on the board of uh, Denver Health for many years. He was royalty. He really was. Everybody looked up to him, and he was a, a, a fantastic orator. The Alliance became the center point of the West Side. At one time, there were about a thousand families affiliated when we were on the West Side. Over the years, in the, come in the late 70s and into the late 90s, the synagogue population started to shrink to about 400 families. And that was due to uh, migrations to East Denver, Southeast Denver. Uh, not many uh, of the next generations of founding families and so forth were as orthodox. And it was at that point where we became a conservative synagogue and affiliated ourselves with United Synagogue of America. Eventually, the Hebrew Educational Alliance moved um, southeast where it's located today. So the three main streams of Jewish worship uh, observance, there's Orthodox, which is very conservative religiously and socially. There's conservative, which we are, which we're kind of in the middle of the road, if you will. We are traditional but egalitarian. And you have reform, and reform is a little is, is more liberal. So not conservative in the same sense that you're thinking about um, as illiberal or, or conservative or less progressive. Um, it's, it's not politics, so it, it takes on a completely different uh, connotation. I believe their goal was to conserve a number of the Jewish traditions and um, become more modern and Americanized at the same time. They felt that there was a need to make compromises on traditional Jewish observance in order to be able to keep Jews connected to tradition. And it really swept across America that many congregations that had been Orthodox gradually shifted towards conservatism because that was just the reality of how Jews were living their lives. Uh, you know, the Orthodox world, the, you know, the, the rabbis of the Orthodox world and the communities obviously uh, would object to that approach, but that's what happened. Oh. I am the uh, program coordinator here at the Hebrew Educational Alliance. I help put together major programs that we do. So this evening is our monthly Azamra musical Friday night Shabbat service. It is a uh, very attractive and inspiring and spiritual and uplifting Friday night uh, service as we welcome the Sabbath. It's not common in, in many synagogues or more very traditional synagogues to use musical instruments, but we still maintain the decorum and respect and honor of, of the Sabbath that uh, we use them prior to sundown. On the Sabbath, as Jews, when we observe it, we're given a second soul, an additional soul that stays with us through the Sabbath day and till the end of the Sabbath, enliven ourselves and re-engage ourselves and restart ourselves and rejoice with ourselves and re-emerge back to the normal world ahead of us. We have something for everybody here. And this is another reason why this synagogue from this old synagogue from the West Side has evolved. The 
Orthodox community over here is still a very important and recognized part of the community, but it's not as much up front and out in the streets as, as it used to be. If you walk on the street over here, let's say on Shabbos, uh, you know, you would see everyone walking around in their suits, you know, and, 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 you know, and the women in their nice Shabbos finery, and you would see the community out in force. You see that community still happening, you see it's going on, but I think there was a lot more of it. As Denver has expanded and grown, the Jewish community, uh, the West Side, in a way, has shrunk. Um, at the same time, it's still very tight and very close, but there was much, there were more amenities on the West Side growing up. My husband Robert and I came to Denver in the fall, October actually, 1963. We moved into this house in January of 1965. We've been here ever since. We had, when I initially came here, we had a kosher uh, fresh chicken place. You could get fresh fish, any, you know, kosher food items. There were two Drug stores that were run by Jewish, Jewish pharmacists, Tobin's and uh, Emerson. I was born in St. Anthony and I grew up actually until a couple weeks ago. I actually lived on the same block almost my entire life. I don't know if it was because I was a child and everything thinks, it seems bigger when you're a child, um, but it was definitely very powerful. So great memories growing up. All our four children were raised here. I think it's been a wonderful environment. They're all wonderful people, if I say so myself. And um, it, it was a very, I think, a very nurturing and very rewarding location, I guess I would say, to, to raise a family here. We've never regretted buying this house. It's one of the, I think, one of the more attractive houses over here. It's well built and nice size rooms right next door to the synagogue. <laughs> Orthodox Jewish life is very much contingent on having the institutions around. So, you know, the vast, vast majority of Orthodox Jews have to live in a relatively small area because they have to have access. You know, we don't send our children to regular secular schools. You know, we send them to private Jewish schools. Uh, we attend our synagogues on Shabbos, Shabbat. We can't drive, so you've got to be within reasonable walking distance of the synagogue. So Zaire Abraham has been an anchor here, you know, since 1887. It's, it's moved several times. It is pretty rare for um, an Orthodox synagogue to remain in the same physical place. You know, there, there's a joke they say about, you know, Jews always like to have different opinions, and, you know, I like this, I don't like that. So there's a joke they say about a Jewish fellow who got stranded on a desert island, and when he got rescued, they found two synagogues. And the, the rescuer said, why do you have two synagogues? And he said, well, one I pray in and one that I don't pray in. But <laughs> over here, there's just one synagogue. So I guess that speaks to the fact that maybe we're not <laughs> uh, dealing with that challenge. It is um, the anchor for the neighborhood. A lot of religious events, obviously, and daily, daily services all the time, and, and some social events, too, and programs for children, and lectures for all ages and interests. It's the first synagogue that, was, that existed on the West Side, and the only one that um, has remained here. So there are a number of, of important Jewish institutions that are here on the west side. And we have the boys' high school, Yeshiva Taras Chaim, and that has been around for over 50 years. It was founded in the late 60s. Beth Jacob High School is also founded in the late 60s, and that's the girls' high school. So the Yeshiva is a institution of higher education. About, um, its primary goal is to educate uh, boys, Orthodox boys, 9th through 12th and post high school. Yeshiva draws about 50% of its students locally from Denver, 50% from out of town. The Yeshiva is a boarding school, so almost everyone stays in the dormitory all the time, even locals. It's a whole experience. It's not just a day school that you come in the morning and leave at night. They're here all day, they're with their peers, they're growing up together. Um, it's just an experience that you can't replicate. It's, it's a very powerful experience. 25 years ago, the community opened up what's called the Denver Community Kolel, and that's a institution of higher study of Torah and education. 
I believe that a major reason why the community is still here, while other communities, Jewish communities across America, have not necessarily continued to exist, uh, is because you have those vital institutions. Whenever there's been a down or been a challenge, I find that this, the institutions have stepped up, the institutions have invested in the community heavily, and have raised money. So we all have really come together when the times have been tough and figured out ways how we can move forward and thrive instead of just survive. Right now we're actually in the middle of a concerted effort community-wide to grow. We have actually nine families that are moving here and we're looking forward to you know younger families who are going to you know give a real shot in the arm to inject vibrancy and energy and we're hoping that will be a start of you know building energy and excitement and opportunities for other people to move here down the line as well. Today there are probably still at least a hundred Orthodox Jewish families in this neighborhood but with the transformation um, in the architecture um, in the housing. Most young people can't afford to buy a house in this neighborhood anymore, and that's very, that's very sad. That's probably our biggest challenge in retaining and keeping the continuity of the Jewish community here on the west side. My son took me down there not long ago. They tore down my father's buildings and a lot of the other buildings that I was familiar with and I just didn't like what they're doing. So what can I say is, <laughs> it's okay. We can't stop the progress. The old people cannot build high rise buildings and things like that. The young people have to take it over and do what they have to do. But I still miss it, I do, I do. My house doesn't exist anymore because we moved and we knew they were going to tear it down. Thank God my grandma's house is still standing on Knox Court. It's a little sad, but you can't expect it to stay the same. They've taken away so much of the history. The young people that are across Colfax in those high-end townhouses and such, they're there for the moment. A lot of our neighborhood has been really transformed. There are some nice things, and I'm always glad to, to welcome new people. But it's taken away the character of the single houses where people knew their neighbors very well. And now if they have porches, they're on the, t on the fifth floor somewhere looking down, and, and people don't you know, know one another necessarily. And I don't think we realized how good it really was. But as you look back upon it, people liked each other. Not everybody, of course, but most people helped each other. When we got together at my grandmother's house, there was so much noise, and the women would yell, sha, 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 which in Yiddish means be quiet. But the kids could not be quiet. They had a good time. It was fun. It was fun. It was. I'm very sad because I think they've torn down so much history that people won't remember what it was, you know, when we grew up. And we get together with friends that have grew up there and that's all they talk about. Do you remember this? Do you remember that? And it's not there anymore. It was a Camelot in a way. It was almost like a Brigadoon sometimes. There still are congregants here who are from the west side, and uh, it's, a, it's a good place to be from. It's a proud place to be from. Uh, we don't just sit around and say west side or west side, but you know, there's a little bit of street cred there when you can say you're a west sider. <laughs>Ms. Abrams, can you just remind me where we're starting from today? Summit Bay, mm -hmm. down four wide lines, Omar. I think that a lot of people expected the community to kind of fall apart and dissolve a lot of times. We're still here, which, you know, is kind of the story of the Jewish people, period. <laughs> we, we've been written off a lot of times historically, and we're still here. But how many people can still say that they're really still good friends with the kids that they grew up with, with someone that they grew up with? 
Hebrew we call it the Kesher. Kesher means connection, and you, you still have that connection. Instead of being able to go to everybody's houses, at least I can come to this house and still have that tangible moment to my past. It's history, my history in my heart. And we're still a community. Maybe we're living farther distances out, but we still manage to come together and still be a community. I had the experiences that you could never imagine. I'm happy about it. I'm thankful for it. It means so much to me, and I hope it'll mean so much to other people as well. The community has had its ups and downs, I'd say, over the last 50 years. Right now, I would say we're at a little bit of an ebb. We are working on, on building that back up again and getting everyone really well connected and understanding what we need to do as a community to be able to move forward and to you know, continue and, and build and, and uh, exist here.